Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Woo! Sabbath. I'm camera shy. Kane, Kim is camera shy. Did you hear that? <laughs> Guys, we just want to say happy Sabbath to you. We're so glad that you can join us for part two of our series here at Eastside SDA Fellowship. That's my hype man. Woo! Everyone needs a hype man. It's important. You need a hype man. Actually, we were doing a Bible study the other day um, and we were looking at John the Baptist, remember? Mm -hmm. And you remember we actually worked out who John the Baptist was in relation to Jesus. Uh -huh. Who was it? They're cousins. Yeah, but apart from the cousins, he was Jesus' hype man. Oh, hype man, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. that's what we re recognize. Um, so everyone needs a hype man in their life. Let's go. <laughs> this morning, um, despite the social isolation, despite the fact that the world seems a bit crazy, we're going to pause for just a few moments and we're going to spend some time in the Word of God. I believe the Word of God has something special for us, it can encourage us and really give us a message of hope, especially in these times. And so here's the opportunity for you now to stop whatever you're doing, make sure the sound is up, your screens are there and, and concentrate as we're about to get into the word of God. So shall we pray? Let's do that together. Father, we just wanna say thank you so much for giving us your Holy Spirit to comfort us at these difficult times. But Lord, uh, as we're about to go into the word right now, we're asking for you to be with us. Help us to be able to hear what it is you have to say. We also wanna take the time out and pause and pray for all those who are affected by COVID-19 in any kind of way possible, Lord. We know that people are scared and worried and confused. May your peace come over them right now, Lord. Jesus, we're thankful for being and having the opportunity to come and serve you this morning. We want to say happy Sabbath to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, welcome to the Miserable Man of God part two. Last week, we learned that the book of Jonah is in fact a story that is less about the message that God asked the prophet to deliver and more about the actual prophet that God asked to do the delivering. Many times... We focus solely on the message that needs to be transmitted. And although words can make a big impact, I'm suggesting that people make more. Jonah, the prophet, had the word of Yahweh, but lacked the spirit of Yahweh. Many people today carry the word on their person. Maybe you've met those who can wax lyrical from memory, the poetic blessings of what the Bible to offer. But here's the problem that most people suffer from when asked by God to deliver mail. God does not require you to deliver his word without experiencing it. And that's why the book of Jonah stands alone in scripture. It presents the huge chasm that exists between man and the message. Today we go deeper in part two of the miserable man of God. So read with me. Jonah is where we are, chapter one, and I'm gonna read verse one to three. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Okay, okay, I know, I know. If you've been following this series and you've been with us last week, you may have noticed that last week we actually focused on verse one to three. So why am I reading this again? So I have to make some confessions in my prep. I was really excited to go to the next part of the story. I, I really wanted to go down to Joppa and board the ship with Jonah and head to Tarshish. And in my prep and my research, and I'm there and I'm going for it, and I can't help but think, th think to myself that there's some unfinished 
stories that we still have to delve into in verse 1 to 3. The more I tried to move on to get down to Joppa, to get on the boat, to go to Tarshish, the more I felt God was calling me back to the first three verses that we spent on. Yes, I have a message for you today. And here it is. God is not finished with the three verses of Jonah. I know it's crazy, right? There's so much that we can just juice out of the first three verses. But I want to be able to do this justice. I want us to be able to spend enough time thoroughly hearing what it is God has to say. And I'm not making any apologies. We are in the first three verses still in Jonah chapter 1 verse 3. I had planned to myself that maybe this was going to be a a four or five part series. But who knows? Who knows how long this could go for? But one thing is for sure. If God wants to speak through the book of Jonah, I want to be able to let him speak. So I want to let you know that this is okay for us to spend more time in verse 1 to 3. So stick with me. Jonah chapter 1, 1 to 3. There's more blessings that we can reap from this. Let me point your attention to a couple of things. This isn't the only time that the Bible speaks and mentions of Jonah. You may know that in Matthew chapter 12, 39 to 40, Jesus actually prophesies using the story of Jonah. Um, And he specifically talks about Jonah being in the belly of the great fish for three days and and three nights. And that's, that's one aspect. That's one time that Jesus mentions Jonah. There's also another time that Jesus mentions Jonah. And that's in 2 Kings 14. And verse 25. I'm going to read it for you. 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25. He restored the border. He, being an evil king named Jeroboam II, he restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah or the Dead Sea, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant. Yep. You guessed it, Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath, Hepha. So Jonah is not a new character in the storyline of the Bible. The book of Jonah actually, in itself, gives him kind of a bad rap. I mean, I don't blame why they give him a bad rap. But Jonah actually is someone who has the history of a great legacy. I know this is not what you expected, But let's dive into a little bit more of the truth of who is this Jonah, son of Amittai, found in the book of 1 Kings? Well, he was a prophet that was well known for one of the largest expansions of Israel's territory in the Old Testament. The word of Yahweh came to Jonah and he gladly delivered good news to a wicked king of Israel at the time. This was a king called Jeroboam II, a wicked and evil king that followed the line of all the evil kings before him. This good news that he brought was that God was not going to give up on Israel, but offer his grace. Thus, Jonah prophesied kingdom expansion where Israel was able to recover so much miles. I want to show you a map. Um, I'm going to geek out a little bit. Have a look at this. All right. If you can see this quite clearly on your screen, this is a map. Uh, We have Israel over here. Okay. We have Lebanon over here, Syria up here, Cyprus is up here. I think my tech guy is going to do his best to try and get in for us. Okay. Now, Just to let you know, Jonah, the son of Amittai, prophesied that Israel's kingdom would expand. Israel was down here and their territory was around this area over here. Because of what Jonah prophesied to the evil king Jeroboam II, he expanded the land and they were able to conquer all of this territory, approximately around 270 miles right the way through Lebanon, um, where they conquered Damascus, and all the way up to Hama, in the Bible known as Lebo Hamath, the door of Hama. This huge span was one of the largest expansions of Israel's territory. And this successful yet evil king, Jeroboam II, reigned for 41 years. Okay, that's my geek stuff done. Let's, let's understand what why, does that, why is this important? Why, why is it important that you know that this kingdom expanded for 270 miles? Um, well, let's, let's understand a few things. 
the, the, Is, the Israeli kingdom had lost their territory previously to the Assyrian Empire. Those, those were their enemies. Those were the pagans. Those are the ones who came in and stormed in, destroyed everything and stole their land from them. But here we're talking about a king, even though he was so evil, even though his land was walking away from God, was offered the grace to increase that land again. This is like the distance from, if you're from Seattle and you know the area, this is like the distance from here in Seattle to College Place, Walla Walla, 270 miles. It's a huge amount of distance. And here's where Jonah comes in. Jonah becomes the trademark prophet who was known for bringing good word from God to Israel, the evil nation of Israel at the time. Imagine being known and loved even as Jonah the good news guy. Yep, that's what he was known as. Jonah the good news guy. Dove, son of of faithfulness whenever you hear his name and you see him on the street good news is on the way that's my guy jonah people get excited when they heard jonah's around because whether you deserved it or not good news was on the way if jonah was in the picture i remember when i was a driving instructor in england and i was teaching a student um he was six foot four okay he was built like a bull okay you have to see how funny this look imagine if you if you have the, uh, the picture of me and the student in the car, the, uh, the six foot four guy is sitting in the driver's seat and preparing himself. And um, he, has to, he has to get in the car and push the seat all the way back just so that his long legs can fit in the car. Now, picture the scene with me, all right? Now move, move your gaze from the student now over to the driving instructor, and then you see me. I know, right? It's a bit of a weird scene to see who this driving instructor is. Most people who would step into my car probably take one look at me and think, so where's your dad? Are you the one that's teaching me? Yep, that's kind of usually what probably goes through people's mind and I tend to have to try and prove myself as an instructor. So here I am teaching this student to drive and he does really well. We get to test and he goes for his test and I sit in the waiting room. He comes back um, after, after the test and he passed his test. When I tell you how excited and happy this guy was, he literally jumped on, bear, on me, bear hugged me, picked me up and started chucking me around the place like this. I'll never, remember, I'll never forget that great celebration that he was so happy to pass his test and so grateful to me that I was the driving instructor that took him through that. He almost crushed me with his bear hug, uh, but that's not the only reason why I remember that particular student. After that experience, I, con- I con- consequently got four more students because of that student. Why? Because good word got around that there was this short Asian guy that looked like he just stepped out of college and was an amazing driving instructor. Yeah, I said it. I'm an amazing driving instructor. That's exactly the kind of vibe Jonah was walking around with. When Jonah walks into the room, you're going to fanboy over him. Here we have a prophet of Israel asked to come to his own wicked people with good news. He was born and bred in the land of the chosen people. And even though the wickedness of Israel grew with the generations through Jeroboam II and kings before, God sent Jonah to his own people to deliver God's grace. We are reminded of a God who has so much grace upon the wickedness of humanity that he sends the dove to save them from themselves. Amen? Isn't God good? And then we come to the book of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Hang on a minute. Wickedness has come up before me. Is this talking about Israel? The chosen people of God? Or is this talking about pagan Nineveh? Because 
God commands a prophet of Israel to leave the territory and safety of the covenant group of people and find the him, himself in the Assyrian territory, the pagan lands, the enemies, namely the largest and most dangerous city of Nineveh. And God commissions Jonah to give them a message. Cry out to the great city, Nineveh, God says. Cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up against me. These are the same enemies that have been slaughtering and terrorizing and torturing and stealing and pillaging Israel and Judah for decades. And Jonah knows that God wants him to bring a message of grace to his people in Nineveh. Uh, guys, can you blame him for booking it to Tarshish, the ends of the earth? Oh, Jonah, Jonah, you miserable man of God. Here are my conclusions as I reflected upon this. There is no difference between the spiritual condition of Israel and the spiritual condition of Nineveh. As there is no difference in the graciousness of God to Israel and the graciousness of God to Nineveh. But for some Reason This part-time selective prophet is willing to be faithful to God in rescuing Israel, but makes a passive-aggressive move by boarding a ship to the ends of the earth, destructive to the fate of Nineveh. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German anti-Nazi pastor who was vocal against Hitler's regime, says this, silence in the face of evil is itself evil god will not hold us guiltless not to speak is to speak not to act is to act jonah is only happy to follow god when it suits him when the word of yahweh comes to dove son of faithfulness the one who brings supposedly good news from a lineage of faithful people jonah taps out and says thanks but no thanks Man, isn't this story so irrelevant? Coming to this country, I realized very quickly the obsession that these people, Americans, have with basketball. <laughs> it's early days for me, but I think that obsession that America has with sports in general makes the British interest with football, I, I mean, real football, what you call soccer, um, it makes... It makes the British interest with sports so tiny. I never grew up with basketball, so forgive me for not even knowing all the rules. Um, but here was actually, here in Washington was where I went to my first ever basketball game. Yep, and it was at PSS, PSAA, Puget Sound Adventist Academy. Um, I was invited by one of my church members here, Bernard, um, and he asked me to come and see the game because two of our, our, our youth were actually playing. I think it was Aiden and Bryson who were playing. Um, so I turn up at the game at the school. I, I come to the gym um, and uh, they're playing. I can't even remember who they were playing. Their, their home team um, of who Bryson and Aiden play for are the Sharks. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, that was your cue, Kane. Sharks? No? Okay, all right. all right. My hype man is a bit. My hype man is a bit sleepy today. Don't worry. You, you should see this guy on when we're in the when we're in the gym, and he's hyping the whole room when it comes to to the sharks. But anyway, so there I was. I walked in my first ever basketball game I've ever been to. I saw Bryson and Aiden practicing on the other end of the court, and so I walked all the way down past the first set of benches over to the second set of benches because that's where they were. They were close there. It was just me. I didn't really know anyone, and I came and sat down on those benches. Um, five minutes later, Bernard walks in and he spots me and I'm waving at him, happy to see him. And you should have seen the look of horror on his face. Ever so subtly, Bernard walks over to me and he grabs me by the arm like a kid who had stolen the cookie from the cookie jar. And he ushered me over to the other benches near the door and plunked me down to sit. And he said to me, what were you doing over there? And I'm looking at him like shocked, like, uh, what? He said, you were sitting on the opposition benches. You're, you were on the wrong side, he says. I mean, 
Obviously, I was there to support the Sharks, but I didn't know where I was supposed to sit. Man, you should have seen the look of embarrassment on Bernard's face when he took me over to the other benches. Funny, he didn't introduce me to anyone on those benches, but once I was on the Sharks' side of the benches, he, then he began introducing me. Hey, man, this is my pastor, this is my pastor. <laughs> It got me thinking about a lot of things and I wondered to myself, have, have you ever found yourself in enemy territory <laughs> without possibly even knowing that you're there? Jonah, on the other hand, comparatively the prophet, a crazy Seahawks flying, by the way, he's called to God to go to the Super Bowl with his football jersey and hat and sit right in the stands of the 49ers, rubbing shoulders with the enemy. This is exactly the problem that Jonah faced. Jonah booked it to Tarshish because God had told him to go and offer bandages and supplies to the enemies. Jonah's problem with God was that God was playing for the wrong team. God was on the wrong side. And Jonah came to the conclusion that God needed to go over, go over to the other bench. But the word of the Lord comes to us, beloved. God is not on Israel's side. God, he is not on Nineveh's side. He is not on the side of the Jews or the pagans. No, God is not a Republican and he is not a Democrat. God is on God's side. The question that we have to ask is whose side are we on? But Jonah did the cost-benefit analysis. Nineveh will either kill Jonah or God is going to give them grace. So he pays the price on the ship to flee from the presence of God. How many times have we paid the price for trying to flee from God? We know, too, too, we know full well that God is saying to us. We know too well what God is actually saying to us. But we'd rather place ourselves in a position where it simply becomes impossible to follow God. Sorry, God, can't follow you. I'm sorry. I'm kind of in the middle of the ocean right now on a boat, so you should probably pick someone else. The cost is high to travel to the ends of the earth, folks. It does actually say in verse 3, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid his fare. Because he's an honest guy. Yeah, good guy, Jonah. An honest guy. But it does cost a lot to travel in the opposite direction that God wants us to go. And the problem with paying so much to avoid your godly calling, where you may choose not to be physically in the will of God, you are left with a war going on in your mind about what you know you should be doing. Half the times, I don't need to pray to God because, well, I already know what he's been saying to me for the longest while. I mean, if I do pray, most of the times I want him to be able to agree with me. And that's when the justifying questions pop into my head. Why didn't God send someone else? Doesn't he know that Nineveh will just continue to dis disrespect him over and over? Why couldn't God rise up a prophet from Nineveh? Surely that would have been better. But here's, here's one of the most important questions that I managed to surmise. Why would God commission good news in the hands of someone to save wicked people who would kill that very messenger because of who he claims to come in the name of? Did you catch it? For those of you who miss the whiff, the whiff of the gospel there, thousands of years ago, Yahweh sent his only dove with good news for wicked people knowing that the risk of them killing the messenger was worth the cost to offer grace for humanity. You want to know why Jesus quoted the story of Jonah in Matthew chapter 12? Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees and scribes who carried the word of Yahweh but lacked in the spirit of Yahweh. Jesus 
was trying to show them, where Jonah didn't want to take the risk on Nineveh, the son of Yahweh is willing, no, 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 scrap that, the son of Yahweh did actually take the risk for humanity. Hear the word of Yahweh as it comes to you today. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for your wickedness. My sacrifice deems your worth in Yahweh's eyes. His grace is coming for you today. The question is, are you ready? God wears his heart on his sleeve for his people, not the people that you think are his people, but his people, even the ones that you don't think qualify to be his people. Today, Jesus takes a chance, bringing a word to you. He knows that there is a great risk that you might reject him, but he's willing to take that risk. Will you answer the call of Christ today? As greatly wicked as Nineveh is described in the Bible, God's grace is so, so much greater. God's grace is coming for you today. And it's up to you whether you want to accept it in your life. We learn so much from the biblical story of Jonah. But today, I want to encourage you. I want to help you realize that God is a God who has not given up on you. You may feel like that you are lost. But today is an opportunity for you to recognize that his grace, his marvelous grace, is for you.